The shooting at Dead Man's Hill was the most notorious crime of its day. It led to Britain's biggest investigation and longest murder trial. Yet even now, new evidence is still emerging. And while more remains hidden, the case will continue to reverberate. The crucial witness was Valerie Storey, who had miraculously survived. I think Valerie Storey is about the only person that would have lived. I think most other women would have died. Um, she was just really so determined to live. Um, and wanted this man caught so much that um, she, she just pulled through. But she had an awful lot of courage. She was talking and was very angry at what had happened. And she kept repeating, you know, and asking me um, to promise her that we would catch the men concerned. The police officer in whose division this happened is Superintendent Morgan of Biggleswade. Superintendent, what help do the police want from the public? Well, we are anxious to trace a man of the following description, aged about 30 years, 5 feet 6, proportionate build, dark brown hair, palish face, um, brown eyes, very deep set, not very deep set, straight nose, wearing a dark lounge suit, and believed to have a, an East End London accent. The murder hunt began. At 6.30 p.m., the getaway car was discovered in Ilford. The gunman, whose erratic driving had been noticed by eyewitnesses, had abandoned it at 7.15 in the morning. The Morris Minor was taken to Scotland Yard for detailed forensic examination. The killer must have been in the car for almost 10 hours, and there was blood around the driver's seat. Police circulated a report that the murderer's clothing would be bloodstained. The next day, the A6 murder weapon was found on a London bus. A 38 Enfield revolver had been hidden with 60 rounds of ammunition on the top deck, under the back seat. Police were working off two photo fits. Valerie's stories, and, on the right, one compiled by the witnesses who saw the getaway car in the early morning. Scotland Yard had been called in. The man detailed to head the investigation was one of the Metropolitan Police's most experienced detectives, Superintendent Bob Acott. But amid growing public concern, the police had no real leads, no motive. Superintendent Acott returned to Valerie's story, still in hospital. We've had three weeks so far, Acott told her. We have no name or anything. We depend entirely on you. But Acott was disappointed. Story admitted that she and Michael Gregston, a married man with two children, were having an affair. But she insisted that this could not provide a motive for the murder. Janet Gregston, Michael Gregston's widow, who knew of her husband's affair, visited Valerie Storey in hospital. Afterwards, Mrs Gregston said the killer must have been a maniac. On September the 11th, the murder hunt turned to London's Maida Vale. The police were telephoned by the manager of a cheap guest house. The Vienna Hotel would become a key location in the case. That morning, the manager was inspecting his bedrooms. He entered a basement room which hadn't been slept in for three weeks, not since the day before the murder. The room was supposedly cleaned regularly. But no one before the manager had spotted what was on a bedside chair. Two spent cartridge cases. They came from the murder weapon. 
The police now had their first suspect, Peter Louis Alphon. Alphon, an unemployed drifter, was already under police scrutiny. In several respects, he matched Valerie Storey's description of the killer. And Peter Alphon had checked into the Vienna Hotel on the day of the murder under a false name. The police named Alphon as the wanted man. He gave himself up and, amid great publicity, was put on an identity parade. But Valerie's story failed to pick him out. Alphon was released and celebrated with his mother. The police, who had been certain they had their man, had to start again. They returned to the Vienna Hotel. Alphon had stayed in room six. Now the police concentrated on room 24 the basement bedroom where the cartridge cases were found, and on the identity of another man who'd registered under a false name, Jay Ryan. Jay Ryan was James Hanratty, and he was the last occupant of room 24, where the cartridge cases from the murder weapon were found. James Hanratty was born and brought up in a North London Irish Catholic family. He was sometimes known as Ginger. He left school at 15 without any qualifications. I mean, I'm not belittling him, but he was, he was backward at school. I mean, he could just about read, he couldn't write. I mean, then it was the, the sporting page at the back. 16, 17, we used to, to dress up. In them days, you'd suit up, meet some girls and take them the fun fair and that and different things you know it was it was we had some good times you know but as a teenager Hanratty headed for central London and Soho here he made the acquaintance of a small-time criminal Charles France he got in touch with France up in London and from there he he got into some very bad habits of housebreaking and you know, he was on the fiddle all the time with France. But in the course of different periods, he'd come home and then go away again. But any time he'd done anything wrong, he'd never done it at home. He always went to London to, to do it. From 1955, Hanratty spent most of the next six years in and out of prison as he collected a series of convictions for housebreaking and car theft. On his release in March 1961, he returned to Soho. He renewed his friendship with Charles France and resumed thieving. In late September, Hanratty's family learned the police were looking for him, but they didn't know why. A journalist from the Express said, um, come and he asked about Acot, who'd been. Father said, uh, and he said, do you know, it's serious, it, you're, you're they want your son for, in connection with the A6 murder. Well, it was like hitting you with a bombshell. I went up to the rehearsal club, which I knew he used, to look for him, because I knew Jimmy wouldn't take this seriously. But Hanratty feared arrest for his latest housebreakings, and he went on the run. First, he telephoned Scotland Yard. He told Superintendent Acott where his clothes could be collected for forensic examination and stressed his innocence of the A6 murder. Then he stole a Mark 7 Jaguar and drove north. Hanratty sometimes changed the colour of his ginger hair. He dyed it twice more during his fortnight on the run ending up a startling orange. As a disguise, it was hopeless. The police knew Hanratty dyed his hair. 